Okay, hello everybody. Um, I might have to change my desk location here because I'm going to be pretty backlit every time I do this sort of stuff, aren't I? But really, it doesn't matter because today, actually in class, not today, but on the day I'm going to give you this to read from this book, Art and Fear. And periodically we'll read sections of this and then discuss it. But for those of you who would prefer to hear it, I figured I would read you chapter one, and you could just listen. So, chapter one, the nature of the problem. Life is short, art long, opportunity fleeting, experience treacherous, judgment difficult. Hippocrates. Making art is difficult. We leave drawings unfinished and stories unwritten. We do work that does not feel like our own. We repeat ourselves. We stop before we have mastered our materials or continue long after their potential is exhausted. Our mind, our minds, then the pieces, sorry, often the work we have not done seems more real in our minds than the pieces we have completed. And so questions arise. How does art get done? Why often does it not get done? And what is the nature of the difficulties that stop so many who start? These questions, which seem so timeless, may actually be particular to our age. It may have been easier <clears throat> to paint bison on the cave walls long ago than to write this or any other sentence today. Other people in other times and places had some robust institutions to shore them up, witness the church, the clan, ritual, tradition, it's easy to imagine that artists doubted their calling less when working in the services of God than when working in service of self. Not so today. Today, almost no one feels shored up. Today, artwork does not emerge from a secure common ground. The bison on the wall is someone else's magic. Making art now means working in the face of uncertainty. It means living with doubt and contradiction, doing something no one cares about whether you do or for which there may be neither an audience nor a reward. Making the work you want to make means setting aside these doubts so that you may clearly see what you have done and therefore see where to go next. Making the work you want to make means finding nourishment within the work itself. This is not the age of faith, truth, or certainty. Yet, even the notion that you have a say in this process conflicts with the prevailing view of art making today, namely that art rests fundamentally upon talent and that talent is a gift randomly built into some people and not into others. In common parlance, either you have it or you don't. Great art is a product of genius, good art a product of near genius, which Nabukov likened to near beer, and so on down the line to pulp romances and paint by numbers. This view is inherently fatalistic, even if it's true. It's fatalistic and offers no useful encouragement to those who would make art. Personally, we'll side with Conrad's view of fatalism, namely that it is a species of fear, the fear that your fate is in your own hands, but that your hands are weak. But while talent not to mention fate, luck, and tragedy all play a role in human destiny when they hardly rank as dependable tools for advancing your own art on a day-to-day -day basis. Here in the day-to-day -day world, which is, after all, the only one we live in, the job of getting on with your work turns upon making some basic assumptions about human nature, assumptions that place the power, and hence the responsibility, for your actions in your own hands. Some of these can be stated directly. A few assumptions. One, art making involves skills that can be learned. We're assuming this, right? The conventional wisdom here is that while craft can be taught, art remains a magical gift bestowed only by the gods. Not so. In large me measure, becoming an artist consists of learning to accept yourself, which makes your worst per which makes your work personal, and in following your own voice, which makes your work distinctive. Clearly, these qualities can be nurtured by others. Even talent is rarely distinguishable over the long run from pers perseverance and lots of hard work. 
It's true that every few years, the authors encounter some beginning photography student whose first semester prints appear as finely crafted as any Ansel Adams might have been. And it's true that a natural gift like that, especially coming at the fragile early learning stage, returns priceless encouragement to its maker. But all that has nothing to do with artistic content. Rather, it simply points up the fact that most of us, including Adams himself, had to work years to perfect our art. Assumption number two, art is made by ordinary people. Creatures having only virtues can hardly be imagined making art. It's difficult to picture the Virgin Mary painting landscapes or Batman throwing pots. The flawless creature wouldn't need to make art. And so, ironically, the ideal artist is scarcely a theoretical figure at all. If art is made by ordinary people, then you'd have to allow that the ideal artist would be an ordinary person, too with the whole usual mixed bags of traits that real human beings possess. This is a giant hint about art because it suggests that our flaws and weaknesses, while often obstacles to getting our work done, are a source of strength as well. Something about making art has to do with overcoming things, giving us a clear opportunity for doing things in a way that we have known that we should always have done them. Making art and viewing art, assumption three, making art and viewing art are different at their core. The sane human being is satisfied that he or she can do at any given moment is the best that he or she can do at any given moment. That belief, if widely embraced, would, embraced, would make this book unnecessary, false, or both. Such sanity is unfortunately rare. Making art provides uncomfortably accurate feedback about the gap that inevitably exists between what you intended to do and what you did do. In fact, if art making did not tell you, the maker, so enormously much about yourself, then making art that matters to you would be impossible. To all viewers but yourself, what matters is the product, the finished artwork. To you and you alone, what matters is the process, the experience of shaping that artwork. The viewer's concerns are not your concerns, although it's dangerously easy to adopt their attitudes. Their job is whatever it is, to be moved by art, to be entertained by art, to make a killing off uh, selling art, whatever. Your job, however, is to learn to work and work on your work. For the artist, that truth highlights the familiar and predictable corollary. Art making can be a rather lonely, thankless affair. Virtually all artists spend some of their time, and some artists spend virtually all of their time, producing work that no one else much cares about. It just seems to come with the territory. But for some reason, self-defense perhaps, artists find it tempting to romanticize this lack of response, often by heroically picturing themselves peering deeply into the underlying nature of things long before anyone else has eyes to follow. Romantic, but wrong. The sobering truth is that the disinterest of others hardly reflects a gulf in vision. In fact, there's generally no good reason why others should care about most of any one artist's work. The function of overwhelming majority of your artwork is simply to teach you how to make the small fraction of your work that soars. One of the basic and difficult lessons every artist must learn is that even the failed pieces are essentially x-rayed, um, uh, x-rays of famous painting are, 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 are essential. I'm sorry, even failed pieces are essential. X-rays of famous paintings reveal that even master artists sometimes made basic mid-course corrections or deleted really dumb mistakes by overpainting a still wet canvas. The point is that you learn how to make your work by making your work. And a great many of the pieces you make along the way will never stand out as finished art. The best you can do is make art that you care about and lots of it. The rest of it is largely a matter of perseverance. Of course, once you're famous, collectors and academics will circle back in droves to claim credit for spotting evidence of the genius in every early piece. 
But until your ship comes in, the only people who really care about your work are those who care about you personally, those who close to you who know that making art is essential to your well-being. They will always care about your work, if not because it is great, then because it is yours. And this is something to be genuinely thankful for. Yet however much they love you, it still remains as true for them as for the rest of the world. Learning to make your work is not their problem. Last assumption. Art making has been around longer than the art establishment. Through most of history, the people who made art never thought of themselves as making art. In fact, it's quite presumable that art was being made long before the rise of consciousness, long before the pronoun I was ever employed. The painters of caves, quite apart from not thinking of themselves as artists, probably never thought of themselves at all. What that suggests, amongst other things, is that the current view equating art with self-expression reveals more a contemporary bias in our thinking than an underlying trait of the medium. Even the separation of art from craft is largely post-Renaissance concept, and more recent still is the notion that art transcends what you do and represents what you are. In the past few centuries, Western art has moved from unsigned tableaus of orthodox religious scenes to one-person displays of personal cosmologies. Artist has gradually become a form of identity, as every artist knows, often carries with it many drawbacks as, as many drawbacks as benefits. Consider that if artist equals self, then when inevitably you make flawed art, you are a flawed person. And when, even worse, you make no art, you are no person at all. It seems far healthier to step, sidestep that vicious spiral by accepting many paths to successful art making, from reclusive to flamboyant, intuitive to intellectual, folk art to fine art, one of those paths is yours. Chapter one, we'll talk about it in class.